Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Facebook Live Zion Christian Ministry Tuesday night service. As you know, today we've been shut back down as a county because the amount of cases have gone up over the last two weeks. There are 200 people either quarantined or in isolation. We need to use wisdom. We need to use masks, social distancing, and everything we can to bring it down for the safety of others. By the website now, we need to pray for rest homes because there's a case in one. There's just a lot of things going on. I would rather have people here, but we're going to do what Scripture says in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17 and submit to the governor and his ways. But the gospel still can go out tonight. And so, Lord, I ask right now as I pray that you prepare the people at home to join us in worship and the word. Jesus Christ, we come to lift your name up tonight. I ask you would bless the worship team and pour your spirit over them. And I ask those who will be joining us at home or in the future that they may begin to know all that we're living in right now is a purpose for Christ to draw us to him. Not because he wants to have this pandemic going on. He wants us close to him. And so, Father, may your spirit fall. We thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that comes when we worship. And we say we want more. So you at home, enter in with us. Worship with us. And may God touch your heart. In Jesus' name, amen.
Suddenly I'm not afraid cause you speak And freedom reigns, there is hope In every single word you say I don't want to miss one word you speak Cause everything you say is life to me I don't want to miss one word you speak So quiet my heart, I'm listening Sorrows roll and troubles rage. You whisper peace. When I don't have the words to say, I won't lose hope. When storms won't break, you keep your word. And your promises will keep me safe. And I don't want to miss one word you speak. Because everything you say is life to me. One word you speak So quiet my heart I'm listening When you speak Confusion fades Just a word And suddenly I'm not afraid Cause you speak And freedom reigns There is hope In every single word you say I don't want to miss One word you speak Everything you say is life to me. I don't want to miss one word you speak. So quiet my heart, I'm listening. When sorrows roll and troubles rage, you whisper peace. When I don't have the words to say, I won't lose hope. When storms won't break, you keep your word. Promises will keep me safe Yes, I don't want to miss one word you speak Cause everything you say is life to me I don't want to miss one word you speak So quiet my heart, I'm listening Your ways are higher You know just what I need I trust you, Jesus You see what I cannot see your ways are higher, you know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus, you see what I cannot see. Your ways are higher, you know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus, you see what I cannot see. Your ways are higher, you know just what I need. I trust you, Jesus, you see what I cannot see. One word you speak, cause everything you say is life to me. I 
everything you say is life to me. I don't wanna miss one word you speak. So hide my heart, I'm listening. Cause I don't wanna miss one word you speak. Cause everything you say is life to me. Yeah, I don't wanna miss one word you speak. Hide my heart, I'm
love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Yeah, your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me.
every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. I'm 
Who can melt the hardest heart? Speak life into my soul. Who can spin the world around and hold me ever close? Who can search the depths of me and love me to the core? Who controls the world I see and walks me through it all? Jesus, it's you. Yes, I'll sing of your love. I can't 
worship arise, day and night, night and day, let worship arise, day and night, night and day, let worship arise. You are worthy of it all. 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 From you are all things. To you. Serve the glory. Jesus, Jesus, the earth will shake, the 
tremble before him and chains will break as heaven and earth sing holy is the name holy is the name of jesus 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 the earth will shake and tremble before him and chains will break as heaven and earth sing holy is the name holy is the name of jesus 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 the earth will shake and tremble before him and chains will break as heaven and earth sing holy is the name holy is the name of jesus 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 The King has come, light of the world reaching out for us. There is no other name, there is no other name, Jesus Christ our God. Oh, seated on high, the undefeated one, yeah. The mountains bow down as we lift him up. There is no other name, there is no other name, there is no other name. There is no other name, there is no other name, there is no other name, Jesus Christ our God. Father Rob. We thank you for your presence. There is no other name that we can call upon. There's no other person, Lord, that can fix everything that we need fixed. I ask, Lord, that we would look through your word tonight in Romans and continue to draw closer to the revelation of your son's love for us and our need to love him and submit to him. I pray for all those home, at home during this tough season of not being able to be together like we always have, that we will rely on the presence of God to bring the healing to us that we so desperately need. And so, Jesus, be exalted in our lives. We ask that a holy fire would begin to burn within us. For the season of the day when all the thing opens up and the evangelism of lost souls and burdened people will come to know the love that we know. So bring your presence over us, Father. Open our hearts to your word. May we remove those things that stay in the way of what you want for each one of us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go into the Word tonight, um, just some re memories, I mean some reminders as we're back to doing everything online. You surely can drop off your tithe and offering at the... Uh, slot, the mail slot on the side and or mail it or click on our website and there's many ways that you can give. During this season, as we look about what God has been doing in our finances, we have been blessed because of the faithfulness of God so that we can continue to expand what we want to do online. So in soon, hopefully, We'll be able to just go straight to YouTube Live, and you can click on there, and we won't be going through Facebook forever. That way, we won't have any restrictions on the things that we might want to do. So be aware of the messages you'll be getting, and stay tuned to the Facebook Zion Christian Ministry so you can see what's going on and the text messages that are coming. So let's pray. Father, I ask that the Word of God come forth tonight in your spirit. It would come forth from you, through me, to them. That we awaken ourselves to the season that we live in. 
that it comes around every once in a while where the word of God comes so alive in you know, what you're speaking to us that you might bring a fire to the people tonight as they listen to the word of God and what I believe you have me to share. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We finished up chapter 8 last week. If you've missed messages, you can get online and look them up, either on the web page or on Facebook, YouTube, and get caught up. You can fill your time listening to me if you want, and stay tuned to what the Word of God is saying to us as a church. So tonight in Romans chapter 9, verse 1, Here's the word that we will talk about tonight. I tell you the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continued grief in my heart that I could wish that I myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren. My countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are Father from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is overall eternally blessed in God. Amen. We'll go on, but I want to stop there first. I want you to begin to think about what Paul is saying and the love he had for the nation of Israel, his brothers, the Jews, the Jewish people. As I've read this many times and I begin to think about it today as I'm going to share it, to have such love for those I left behind when I got saved. I want you not to think about the Jewish nation and what Paul's talking about. I want you to think about who you were, who your friends were, who your family, and all those who may not be saved. Because that's what he's saying. I tell you the truth in Christ. In other words, I want you to know, I'm standing before God saying this, and I'm not lying, he says, that my conscience is bearing witness to the Holy Spirit. He is feeling such pain for the lostness of a nation. He knew that they had the covenants and the promises of God. He knew that he was one at one time pulled people away from Christ by the law and by his religion that he was deceived and only by the love of God stepping into his life did he come to know Christ as Savior. So he has this great burden in his heart that he's saying to Christ, if you could remove my salvation so that my brethren would know that you're true Messiah. I can't picture that type of love for those maybe I've even left behind as I walk into Christ and his love for me. To have that type of burden on your heart that people would know Jesus, that you're willing to give up your life for a whole nation as Christ gave up for the whole world, that his brethren would know Jesus. It's hard for me to grip that in my heart. I want you at home and those here on the worship team to think for a moment. What it would be like to have a love for those you left behind in the kingdom of darkness to go back and say, you take me out of your life and put them in. And he understood how much God was the answer to Israel. He understood the glory that Israel was supposed to have. He understood the, the covenants that were laid down by Moses and Abraham. He understood all the promises that God had given Israel and the giving of the law and how they were to serve God and they walked away from it. That is a love that we need in the church again for those who don't know Jesus. Too often, and maybe it's just me, I've been saved since 86, so it seems so long since I was one of those people who did not know God. But as I get older and I'm coming up on my 50th class reunion, 
there's old friends clicking on my Facebook, and I'm thinking about those days when I didn't know Jesus. And if God willing, we, I will get together with me and my wife and go and see people who are still alive that may not know Jesus. And I've had a burden for them. Because many, as they come to know that I'm a preacher after they knew me when I wasn't, can't believe that I'm even serving God. So as I look at this passage tonight, we here at Zion Christian Ministries want to have a revival in Tehama County that spreads over Northern California, that wants to spread to the state of California, that wants to spread to the nation. Not that we are the answer, but we're begging God to come visit us and that his love would overwhelm us and they, he would take something small and people would know it would have to be Jesus. But I think as a church, if we begin to love the way Paul loved his brethren, understanding how much they miss God, how much he missed God in the beginning and didn't believe that Christ was the Savior. He stood at the feet of Stephen as they stoned him to death, believing he was doing right by God. And I wonder how Paul dealt with that all his life, knowing that Stephen was a, one of the saints that he put to death because he believed he was doing right. And now that he's saved, those that he taught that the church and Christ was not real are now blinded because of his teaching. And then he gets saved. So let's talk about us for a moment. When we were unsaved, and the friends and family and the things we used to do, and then we get saved. And we stay in the church, and we walk with God, and then pretty soon we forget where we came from. We forget those left behind that we used to hang out with that we no longer do because now we belong to the family of God. Now we've moved on and we're safe and we enjoy Jesus and we love the power of God. We love the presence of God. We love the blessings of God. And we live in that. But what Paul is saying here, he had all this with Christ and his burden was so heavy that he would give up his salvation if Israel would know. Now we know that God would not allow that because he's bought and paid for so we know that we had such love for those that were unsaved that we would want to give up our salvation. It's hard to imagine that for me because I can't imagine living a life without Christ eternal. But this passage stirred my heart today because I believe that God wants to raise up a church with such love for the lost, for those that now or do not know him, that we once walked away from in our salvation and maybe in our own self-righteousness do not desire even to go talk to them because they are not walking with God. My heart is stirred for a revival. In our second service on Sunday, we got to taste some of that glory coming down in worship. We got to taste the overpowering presence of God to where... I was so weak I could barely walk in the very presence of God because of his holiness that came into the building. There was very few people here because of different situations, but it didn't matter because we just began to sing to God and the love for him, and he came. I can't picture that joy and the love I felt in my heart to say, take it so that my brother might be saved. That's how much Paul was burdened for those who gave up the things of God. Then I began to think about those as a pastor for over 30 years walking with God. And those who I ministered to and led to the altar came and got saved. Those I baptized. Hundreds. And many are not walking with God today. And I begin to think about them being lost out there. 
They made a profession. And so what Paul begins to do in verses 6 through 13, he says this, but it's not the word of God has taken no effect for they are not all Israel who are Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But Isaac, your seed, has been called that is, those who are the children of flesh, these are not the children of God. But the children of promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. And at this time, I will come and Sarah will have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also conceived by man, even by our father Isaac, for the children yet being born, nor have done any good or evil. For that purpose, God, according to the election, might stand, not the works of him who calls. It is said to her, the older shall serve the younger. And it is written, Jacob, I love. Esau, I hate. So when I put the first six verses out and what was stirring in my heart, and then I began to look at what he said next from six on. See, Israel had a promise. But see, Abraham had two seeds, one with Hagar, and one was the seed of promise, and one was not. One was one promised by God to Sarah. And so what Paul is saying right here is that there are those not all Israel are Israel. And I started thinking about that, and I looked it up in commentaries, and I began to think. And I know that this isn't what it says, but this is what came over my mind. For they are not all the church who are of the church. And my heart began to get heavy. Because there's many right now who believe they're okay with God. They may have confessed and walked for a short season. They may have even gotten baptized and they believe their baptism and at the moment and now they're off doing their thing. They're walking in the world, they're doing whatever, but in their heart they believe because they believe they're okay. So when I heard this, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, what Paul is saying, just because you are born in, the, in Israel, you're not of that seed if you don't follow God. So I wonder right now in the burden of what we're going through in our nation and the things that God has spoken to me prophetically for the church. Are we really walking with God? Or are we walking for what we want in God? There's deep questions working through my mind because the church wants, of America wants America to be righteous. We want to do away with sin in our nation. We are going to be coming to an election and we're going to vote believing if we vote for one man or the other that something good is going to happen. Well, I'm telling you, not all the church is a church. Because they've left their covenant with Christ. We've made it more about man than we've made it about what God says to be. So what God is saying to us in this passage in my heart is this. Are you right with Jesus Christ and part of the very plan that God has for your life? Or did you accept something for what you wanted rather than living in what is needed to be a Christian? I remember when I got saved, I wanted to have a bumper sticker with a fish on it. And I wanted to put stickers on my cars. And I wanted to have all these things to prove to the world that I had been saved. <laughs> then at the one point, there was a risk that came out. What would you do? What would Jesus do? WWD. J. Well, 
we have wanted to become a slogan rather than a relationship. We want a nation to follow a slogan of Christianity and not a man named Christ. So when Paul is saying to the Romans in this passage, yes, not all Israel is connected back to God because not all of them chose to follow God. There's some passages I want to share in a minute that makes us wonder what season we're really in. So I'm praying that somebody that used to be here or somebody that used to be in church that think they're okay, but they know they're living in sin, they know they're living in a way opposite of what they came to, is they believe they're part of the church that will be taken care of even though they're not walking with the king who takes care of them. We are in a very dangerous time because there must be a church that rises up that looks like somebody other than the world. We must look like Jesus. We have a covenant, it says, that when we take communion, it's his body and it's his blood, and his blood is the cup of the new covenant, that when we take communion, we are now in covenant with Christ. That means God promises us to be our father and we are his children. We live with a lazy fear about God. When we were down in the beginning of the pandemic, we got to open up the first time outside on May 31st. I mean, I was surprised to see the people that showed up that hadn't been coming to church before we were shut down. I saw people that were hungry to come back in because they were being denied something that they wanted to be in, so they came. And for the first three or four weeks, it was good. Then summer came. And little by little, oh, I'm busy. I can't be there. Then we got shut down again. When we opened back up, they all go on to come back in. And as we are shut down again, people have begun to be busy and not being able to stay forth into the body of Christ. Church. Are we the church? I do believe, and I don't know when he's coming, but I do believe we're an end times church. This may not be one of the big Pandemics of one-third of the population removed, as it says in Revelation, but there's some things that have been working in my mind that someone told me as they studied Revelation. What if this one-third of the world population has been being removed by pandemic after pandemic? And we're coming to the conclusion of one-third of the population been removed since Christ was risen. The word of God says there's something that's going to happen in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 says, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and the gathering to him, we ask you not to be so, so soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. See, people were saying that they'd already missed the coming of the Lord coming back. He said, let one no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless there's a falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple and showing himself that he is God. There's a great falling away that will take place. God even says, if I don't shorten the days in tribulation, all would be lost. We're going through a struggle right now about what church looks like, how we're supposed to do it. There's some churches that will not shut down like we did. 
They'll believe what they believe, and that's between them and their God. I must do what I believe the Scripture teaches me in 1 Peter 2, 13 through 17 in submission. So we're going to fight over what we should do, how we should stay open or closed. But I have a question for you. By being open, does that make us right with God? By coming on a Sunday for an hour, hour and a half, at Zion is two and a half, Does that make us right with God? Or have we fallen into this place of apathy without recognizing our own apathy? Because there's churches right now in the underground church in China and Iran that they have to meet by threes and fours so that they will not be executed. But they have a fire for God because they know if they get caught, they'll lose their head. Have we walked in the power that we're meant to walk in? That Paul was so hungry for Israel to know that he's giving up his salvation that they would know what he knew. Are we so consumed with everything going on in the world that we can't see what God is trying to say to his church do you want to be my church? The church is not because we can meet on Sunday. The church is what belongs to Christ, and we have Christ in us. And what we do on Monday through Saturday is just as important than what we do on Sunday. Sunday should be the end of the week the beginning of a new week, to celebrate everything that we had with Christ during the week instead of something to go do to say that we're okay with God. There will be a falling away in the end day. I don't blame people that aren't here anymore at Zion Christian Ministries. Maybe I hurt you. Maybe I failed. Maybe I didn't do everything right. But I can guarantee you, in my walk with God, if I went by every time I got hurt in church before I became a pastor, I would still be in drugs and alcohol. So what kept me going was what I wanted to be, which was Jesus, not a building, but with God. And I had to find a house to go do it in. I remember my first Good Friday, not even understanding before I got saved what Good Friday was when I grew up. I had no idea. When I was a kid, the bank shut down at noon. It was Good Friday. I didn't know because I didn't know the story. I wasn't in the church. And I remember that first, good, that first Easter week. I only got three weeks vacation in the mill I worked in. And I took that week off so I could spend it to be with Jesus because it was Holy Week because it was in the bullets in the church I went to. It was Holy Week. And there was activities I didn't want to miss. Like Thursday night when I went to my first foot washing. Pretty humbling to take your shoes off and have a man wash your feet. Then Friday, I was all excited to go trying to find the fire of God for Good Friday, and I ran around to church after church that was closed. Because the culture has moved on, you know. We can't shut the business down. We got to make some money. And I believe the reason that happened is the church quit being the church. And I was just amazed. And I went into a church. There were about 10 people there. Had no idea what was even going on. And it was a mainline denomination. I went, okay. I remember walking out going, where is the church? See, I was this idealistic, born-again believer who read the book for the first time and believed it. 
I didn't have all the tradition and all the things of growing up in church that we begin to take every day as normal, but don't take it as special. So I remember that first Easter week, they had Jesus on TV in some miniseries. And I wasn't going to miss it because it was playing at night, and I worked swing shift, and if I missed it, we couldn't record it, so I took a whole week off just to be with Jesus. I don't probably have that in my heart right now. I know God's calling me back to that. And so when I look at this passage of Paul telling Israel that many of you had all you had in the covenants and the promises, the word of God says called, and you were called special in Acts 19, I mean, Exodus 19 at the Mount of God. You're special. You're my special people. Then you go to Peter and he says, we are now the special people. We now are a holy nation. And my heart was just spun. Going, oh my God, where's the hunger in me? I was so excited that first Easter. I was so excited my first Christmas. I took all my drug jewelry, all the stuff that I used to do, and had my best friend who's a jeweler melt all that gold down and make a cross out of it. And I've wore it every day since. So when I look at this cross in the morning, this is what I died to. And I believe God's calling me and people back to what they died to. To live in what they're called to be. Not a religious organization, but the very body of Christ himself. Releasing the miracles of Christ. Releasing the fire of God. Releasing the love that would take a man who was a murderer of Christians to love this nation so much. Take my salvation. So God is doing something in me, and I can't have him do it in you. You've got to say, do it to me, God. He's not going to want you to come after him because you're being pushed. He does not want me to push you into him. He wants you to run to him because his arms are wide open and say, come back to me, church. Come back to what you're called to be. Come back to who you are. Come back to me. Don't be lost as Israel was lost with the promises of God. We've got to have a love for those that we left behind in our salvation. It means we're going to have to fast. We're going to have to pray. We're going to have to give up our time. So I don't want to hear that we can't meet. Because I've been a pastor so long that if you meet every Sunday, you have to make an announcement of what you're going to do three weeks in advance. Because one third won't be there, then another one third won't be there, then another third won't be there. Why? Because they have things to do. So if I'm going to plan something, a month from now, I've got to announce it three weeks in a row because it won't get to everybody. That's not church. That's an organization like the PTA. <laughs> it's like a, an Elks club that they're going to they're have a barbecue and they're going to make sure they got to tell everybody for a month ahead of time. We are the body of Christ. We have the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the power within us by the Holy Spirit to change 
our nation and change our cities, but we must desire to be changed first. We must have a burning desire like the Apostle Paul had for his nation. We have to have for our nation. We have to have for our city, and we have to have for the lost. We must surrender. He gave me a prophetic word. And what I'd like to do on the first Sunday of the year, because January 1, 1994, Zion Christian Ministries went public. We've been in a Bible study for two months. So it's like a, every year God will give me a prophetic word for the coming year. Well, I remember in 2007, he gave me a prophetic word. And he brought it back to me tonight. It's a parable about the church. It's Matthew 25. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. And those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took all the oil in their vessels with their lamps. But by while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slept and slumbered. All of them did. You hear that? And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. That means they got their lives in order. They, they got everything the way it was supposed to be so their light would shine. They trimmed themselves up. They got rid of the stuff that was not burning light in them. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for the lamps are going out. The wise answered and said, no, at least there should be not enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they went with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you neither know the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. You hear that? Half the church is going to miss it. That's not all that it means. But when I was reading chapter 9 to share with you tonight of Romans, Israel missed the Messiah as a nation. Now, many Jews got saved. The church was Jewish in the beginning. We know that by the 12 apostles. We know that the church grew and eventually went into the Gentile nations. And so when I read 9 and I'm thinking about Paul and what he wanted to give up because his burden was so hard for the people of God, now I'm reflecting back. My burden is so hard for the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, if you know me, I haven't always done it right in my burden for you. It took years for me to take my zeal and try to put it in the right place. And I'm sure I burned a lot of people in my desire that everybody have the same zeal I had. And I haven't gotten tempered in my old age. I've gotten wise in my old age. But I want that same fire, and it's coming back. Because see, what happened on Sunday with the presence of God that came and he spoke to me and he said, I'm coming. I'm rebuilding the, Dave, the tabernacle of David. I'm getting ready to re restructure the worship back to me. The church shall rise up. The presence was so heavy, it was physically draining to my body. And it wasn't because we did it right, because the worship team had to take over for a guy whose body was hurting they didn't have time to practice. They didn't have the time to play the right chords. <laughs> it 
It wasn't about the chords. It wasn't about the perfection of the worship. It was about hearts that wanted to worship Jesus Christ, and he came. He filled the house with his presence. So I know what he wants. He wants us back. He's hungry for us. He loves us. He doesn't want you to work for it, but he wants you to have a burden like Paul for the nation of Israel when he did, that we have a burden for our city, for our state, and for our nation. And it's not going to be done on November 3rd. The victory for our nation happened 2,000 years ago at the cross of Jesus Christ. It's going to happen to a church that's going to put Jesus first. What he says first and what he wants us to do first is to love him and worship him. Because he doesn't want us to be asleep without any oil. He doesn't want us to have our lamp trimmed up with no oil. The oil is the Holy Spirit, church, to fill us back up. If I could be where I am right now 15 years ago, I'd have been a better pastor. 20 years ago, definitely a better pastor. But you know, sometimes you have to age to have a good flavor. Sometimes you have to go through and look at yourself. My zeal hasn't changed. The way I want to deliver it has. With greater love, greater understanding, greater prophetic insight. That his church will trim her lamps, be full of oil, and light up a city with the glory of God. And when a city is lit on a hill, when they're driving north and south down I-5, they're going to look to the left or to the right and see a light on a hill shining. They will know that God is with us. And they will stop. And they will know something is different because we've surrendered to be different and to give up the things of old to have back the identity of Christ in his church. Jesus, forgive us for all that we do I think of what your words on the cross were. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. We mean well, my Lord, but we don't do well. Help us in this season again of shutdown to tune on when we go live and not to take it when you want it. But put Jesus first as if you're in this house on a Sunday or a Tuesday. It's interesting. When we first went Facebook Live, we'd have 50, 60 people signing on. And now you know what's happened? Oh, I can sign on tomorrow. I can sign on two days from now. I can go do what I want. And I'll be able to grab the word at my convenience. Can I give you a secret? What Christ did was not at his convenience. It was at the will of God. There's no convenience in the kingdom. There's submission. We're to be good soldiers. I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to me. And I'm asking you, do you want to go where I'm going? It doesn't do any good for a pastor to encourage his congregation to go somewhere 
that he's not willing to go. I don't believe, and I'm praising God, that I don't think he's asking me to do another 40-day fast. <laughs> Two might be enough. I don't think he's asking me to do a 21-day. I did enough of those. Ten days? I did a lot of those, too. But I know what he's calling me to. Not to get him to do something. It's to be with him in something. He's calling us home, church. Not to heaven, but to his presence. I don't know if this made any sense to you as I preached it. May you know my heart. I'm not judging you. I want to enlighten you. I don't want you to be a virgin with no oil. Because one day, I will meet Jesus, and I'll have to answer to what I didn't do to bring glory to his name and to take his sheep that they would be full of oil when he comes back. That's what I want written in my book at the end. Jesus, I left them full of oil, trimmed, lit, and on fire for you. Let us pray. Jesus, I love you. I know you love everybody that's listening. I know who you are, but I don't know who you are. The longer I follow you, the less I know because I find out there's so much to know. But I know one thing, that there's a book that I'm reading by a man of God, and this is what he said. Remember, you do not believe the thing rightly until you act in accordance with it. When you bring life into line with your faith, you are a believer. But when your life is not in line with your faith, you are no true believer at all. We believe in tasted death for every man. We believe that he will soon triumph over all things. And God will put all things under his feet. And I believe that. And I believe there will be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Written by A.W. Tozer, a man of God. See, Lord, whether we know it or not, we're acting out what we believe. And sometimes, Lord, it isn't what you say to be. Help us to surrender. Help us to know the journey you want to take us on will be joyous, powerful, fulfilling, and life-giving. May we know in our heart that you're asking us right now, do you want the oil? I'm ready to give it. And when I give you the oil, will you trim your lamp? Because I'm coming. I'm coming for you because you have come after me. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. See you Sunday morning. Pay attention to our post. We're going to be going more on YouTube. We're going to get equipment squared away. I'm not saying how it's going to be, but we believe that God wants us not just to reach out to Red Bluff, but to the world. God bless you. Love you. And you can send me a message if you didn't like it or you did like it. But all I care about is if Jesus likes it. God bless.